What's up guys, Evan Jarvis here. In today's video, you are gonna to get to know one of my great personal friends and tournament poker mentors, Mike Wasserman. You're gonna be learning two keys for winning big field MTTs like the Sunday Million and the World Series of Poker main event. And finally, I've got a special announcement at the end of the video, so stay tuned and let's get stacking. Hey everybody, this is Alexander Fitzgerald, our Sassanato, doing a new lecture today. This one is entitled, How to Win Big Tournaments. Today we're going to be talking about learning how to win majors. Uh, I was lucky enough recently to put together a product with a former number one ranked player on Earth in tournament play. Uh, the guy did get to number one on Pocket 5, so that was pretty neat. Uh, I always loved the chance to learn, and this was no different. Him and I worked on 25 plus episodes and for days at a time. I learned a ton. Uh, today's lecture is going to be my attempt to create some valuable free lessons from those hours so you can do better in your own big tournaments. So this was the guy I got to work with on the project. Uh, the accolades of Mike Wasserman. Uh, 80,000 plus MTTs played. Uh, for reference, an entire WSOP might be 50 tournaments if you are grinding all day, day in and day out. Uh, so that's quite a bit of experience. Uh, 1 million plus in total profit online, three weekly TLB titles on PokerStars, three top 50 finishes on PokerStars yearly TLB, won the PokerStars Sunday Million, that was really big, I wanted to find a guy who had done that at some point, reached number one on Pocket Fives in September 2015, cashed for 5.8 million across all online poker sites, and cashed the WCP main event twice and counting. Test time. You guys ready to hear some of what he taught me? We're going to do this in a test format again. Uh, all of these are Sunday Million hands. Uh, that seems to be what really cements the ideas. Have a pen and pad ready if you can. Uh, actually, some of them are just from big online tournaments. Not all are from Sunday Million hands, but they could be. The concepts do apply. Also, guys, ask yourself what your honest answer is, what you would do in the field. I was a good test taker as a kid because I was lazy as hell, but by doing that, I never learned the material. I just learned how to outsmart the teacher. You can, you can outsmart me, I'm sure. There are biases in my multiple choice questions, but ask yourself what you'd honestly do in each situation because we do want to correct that. So let's just get you right into the first situation. So here you have ace-king offsuit. There has been a raise from boss playa from under the gun plus two, and then Mr. Jasper on the button has gone ahead and flatted. Uh, we three bet, as we pretty much always should with ace-king here in my mind. Now, some people would say, if you call there, it's profitable, and it's like, yes, if you call with any playable hand, it's profitable, but it is almost always more profitable to three bet. Literally 98, 99% of the time, you wanna play bigger pots with big hands. That's, even when you're out of position, because people are very predictable in deep stack poker these days. When was the last time you there in boss play a spot for Ben Mace Jack? It doesn't happen as much as maybe it did in the infancy of poker, but people sure as hell still flat with it. Speaking of which, we do get a couple of flats in this situation, so boss player does flat us, and our player on the button here goes ahead and calls, uh, Mr. Jasper. And the board comes 9, 5, 10. It's on you. How much do you want to put out there or do you want to check? We're going to do this a little faster, a little more fun this time. I'm going to give you two questions back to back. I want you really quickly to tell me what you would do in each situation. All right, time is up. All right, here, I'll tell you the answer to that first question in just a second, but quickly, think quick. You're probably multi-tabling. You, you raise deep in a tournament. You have a weak big blind and the button player is timid. This guy calls you, he's a 17-15. The board comes ace-king three, your move. There is 2.4K in the pot if you needed that for B, because you should specify an amount if you select B. Don't just blindly say one option.
Time is up. Did you guys catch the issue in these hands? This is a check because in any raised pot versus two players, they're both only going to miss 25 to 35% of the time. Your overcard outs aren't very clean either. So guys, by the way, you should listen to everyone when it comes to poker and just remember everything I say here is my personal opinion, but let me give you why this is my personal opinion here. I do believe this is a check because you two, you do have two cards over a nine here and that's right in the wheelhouse of people when they flat three bets. When people flat three bets, they tend to call with Broadway cards. They tend to call with big aces. Um, this is looking pretty good. Ace nine, ace 10 are definitely in their wheelhouse. A lot, lot of uh, pseudo connectors really connected there. Uh, a lot of the Broadways have gut shots. There is a ton of equity going there. Nines really likely hand for them to call with. Tens really likely hand to call with. And in general, whenever you're going up against two ranges in No Limit Hold'em, even if they're calling ranges, not three back calling ranges, just cold call, uh, just cold calling ranges, both players are only going to miss about 25-35% of the time. A very rough way to do this is imagine both players miss the flop on average about 50% of the time. If you multiply by 0.5 by 0.5, of course, that'd be 0.25. Now, that's not perfect because they do share cards. There are different flops, etc. But it's a good illustration to show you when you do bet into multi-way pots, you need to have something. You need to have a backdoor draw. You need to have multiple backdoor draws. You need multiple overcard outs. Your overcard outs are not clean here. What I mean by clean is if you hit them, you don't know if you want to hit them. If the turn is a king, that just brought queen jack into play uh, severely. King 10 is definitely in these players' range because they are calling with king 10 suited in these situations. Ace 10, Ace 9, definitely in their wheelhouse as well. So you're, when you hit your hand, oftentimes it gives a superior holding to your opponents. And one of the greatest ways to lose money in No Limit Hold'em is with a great pair, a great second best pair out of position. Now this one, uh, this one is a check too. If you said bet here, you have a very bad habit that is stealing from your stack. And I used to have this habit as well, which is I thought when you raise preflop, you were just supposed to see that every single time somebody called you. It, I, I just thought most likely they had missed the board. And if you see that, they were going to fold their high cards. And that was that. Now, I hear this a lot now. But can I bet third pot here? I hear this a lot ever since the third pot bet has become popularized, but here's my problem with it. If you bet half pot, does he fold eights on this board? Now let's think about third pot. Look at it again. If you bet half pot, is he folding eights? I honestly don't know and that's the problem. No one knows. Some regs in this spot will float because the pot is so small, some won't. But if a number of them do float there, we have a problem. And if you bet one third pot, you're just screwed because then he's never folding eights. This is a typical cold calling range, guys. You'll notice 46% of his combinations here are medium pairs that we don't know what to do with, none of which are folding to one third pot. This is our best case scenario, hoping for the best with one half pot. Because this is what happens if he flats with suited aces, like many MTT regs are prone to doing. He has a pair or better nine times out of 10 on this board now. Guys, most of what I teach you that makes money is trying to get people to fold high cards. I know, real brain surgery, right? There's a lot of evidence that people have a hard time folding pairs, but they're very good at folding high cards. So the idea is to continually put yourself in situations where people have a high card, see bet, take their money. Uh, but when they have pairs, while you're coming up, there will come a time you will try to get people to fold pairs. But while you're coming up and you're trying to master low and medium stakes, let's try not to get low stakes players to fold their pairs because they really don't like to do that.
honestly, I saw this distribution and I thought 90% of pairs and then I said a word I probably shouldn't say here. I don't know about you guys, but trying to get people to fold pairs and no limit hold them is not something I gamble on. One million in profit means being careful. What I learned from Mike was to sweat these decisions constantly. He never made an automatic play. Did you have an automatic answer there? Then you're wrong, regardless. If he knew the guy was a nit who wouldn't continue with a small pair, he bet Mike would when we were doing a lot of this analysis. However, if the guy was a reg who wanted to fight a lot, say a 45% fold to see better below, he gave up. All of those three big blinds C bets saved up added to another stack by the end of the tournament. So that's why for number one in how to win big tournaments, let's start with don't piss away C bets. Guys, do you bet the same thing for every continuation bet? How about on the turn? Do you always bet the same amount? River? If we put a supercomputer on the problem of No Limit Hold'em, what do you think the chances are the AI would find that every single preflop raise is supposed to be 2.5x? Early position, middle position, button ante, no ante, every single one? And every single C bet was supposed to be half pot. Every single C bet was supposed to be one third pot. Whatever it is, we need to move away from that. We need to think about, that was something I was very impressed about by Mike. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna use a couple minutes here just to go off of my notes, go away from my notes, which is, I have never seen a guy sweat so many decisions in my life and just was so concerned with being precise. Yet, when you find mediocre MT tiers, and there have been seasons of my career where I was a very mediocre MT tier, where you just become very arrogant. You think you can get people to do what you want and you don't accept reality on reality's terms. If someone backing up to this situation, let's go, let's go right back to that flop. Let's go back to this situation. When we get, when we're running really well, we'll start doing things automatically. And we're, when we're running really poorly, we'll try to get people to do what we think they should do. Oh, I'm raising from earlier position. You should respect me. Or I'm doing really well right now, so I'm just going to go ahead and bet there. But when people cold call there, what they tend to have is small pairs and aces, big cards. Well, if we don't know if he's folding the small pairs and we know he just connected with all these aces, what is he folding? That seems to be a common misunderstanding I find with many people when they approach poker is they're not thinking about their opponent. Your hand is easy to play. Your hand is right in front of you. But here's the thing. If a big blind player called you, not holla at you boy because he's very disciplined, but let's say the typical guy calls you from the big blind, he has 35% of hands. Now he's got a lot of 10-6 suiteds and things that he's willing to fold. So you could go ahead and see that on this board. If the button calls you, he might have a few suited gappers. It, it probably is still a check, but it's a little less likely that this is a C-bet. Now when this person calls you, especially if there were a rejam stack behind you, especially when the guy is a 1750, there is no rejam stack. I'm just discussing a hypothetical. But when you have a somewhat tight player call you with four players left to act, when you have raised from early position, again, the range is going to be big suited cards, probably not just offsuit broadways, and suited aces, and it's going to be pairs. So when you're looking at these boards, a lot of times the proper strategy is just to give up or to start preparing to triple barrel because you think he has a lot of one pair combinations that barely connected and you think he's going to fold. But there's, there's two different ways you'll see pros approach this. One is they'll have a guy who's super disciplined and they think he's not holding on with a king or most of his garbage aces by the river. So they're gonna go, right? If they had a flush drop per se, right? The other thing that you'll see a lot of really good players do is just check fold. 
they'll they'll just accept reality on reality's terms. They're always trying to get heads up with this guy. They're always trying to get heads up with someone out of position who's calling too many hands and they're going to get it. And they're very big on the three bet. And when they do that, they're also looking for specific boards. Say the board came something 9-3 deuce. And we knew the guy had a lot of overcards and also good aces and his small pairs. Well, obviously the small pairs are not folding now, but maybe a lot of those overcards are folding. And they think about the specific opponent. Would that person specifically just fold their cards on the flop? Or does this person have a fold to see bet that is 45% or lower, which indicates this person likes to fight versus the person who has a 60% or higher fold to see bet. This is somebody who is very fit or fold. And the reason why this is so important is if you do save all those C bets of 2.5x, 3x, 3.5x, if you save three of those in a tournament, that adds up to 10x. I have won tournaments coming back from 10 big blinds, and so have you. That is an extra life in tournament play. And over a big tournament's lifespan, which is going to be hundreds and hundreds of hands, that can add up to 20 or 30 big blinds. That many of us have pissed away before. I have, you have done so before because we're just multi-tabling, not paying attention. Okay, we're heads up, that's great. And the one that really worries me is someone who always has to see that just because they were the pre-flop raiser and it doesn't matter how many people called them. You will see that all the time. If you want to find a guy who can play ball, it's usually the guy who will check fold in one of the first orbits. He gets called by a guy from, he opens from early position and a guy from really early position as well calls him. He gets a bad board and he goes, I am out of here. I'm saving my 3X and I'm going home and I'm taking my ball with me. That's it. And the guy I always know who's going to struggle, even if it's not that day, it might be throughout his career. It's going to be the guy that just fires, gets called, is incredulous and tries to find his way out. Moving forward. So let's take a look at this hand. So uh, Phil Buster, excellent name, by the way, it goes ahead and opens and it's a 2X open, 46 big blinds effective. What is your option that you would like to select? Time is up. This razor is 1816, slightly more solid reg. You have 89 suited, 40 big blinds effective. What is your decision here? All right, time is up. Ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, both of these are three bets. But these hands flop well, you might say. Every good hand flops well. That's why they're good hands. I do not care about balance unless I play with the guy every single day. If I argue for a call versus a random guy who doesn't know me, then all I'm trying to do is justify my wanting to see a flop. That is my sincere belief. The thing that bugs me about this is that I am genuinely trying to get better. I'm not the best professional, so I'm always trying to learn. I barely graduated high school, so I'm open to being wrong. The in Okay, before I lose my mind. This is a guy three betting every type of hand there is, okay? The highlighted so select, ugh, the highlighted section is the only one where he has a negative EV. 
You'll notice this is the only one. He is profitable with pocket aces, profitable with big ace hands, profitable with big pairs, medium pairs, he's profitable, low pairs. He's just making a big blind every time he does it. Suited aces, he needs some work. Suited connectors, uh, but he's profitable. Suited connectors, he's making money. Suited one gappers, suited two gappers, other suited hands, non-suited aces. Uh, non-suited connectors, non-suited one gappers, non-suited two gappers, other non-suited hands. That's really like king three offsuit, whatnot. Anywho, uh, and really he's gonna be unprofitable in one of these just due to variance. Now this is the same guy I just pulled up. Uh, this, is, this is someone I know. Uh, then you'll look at the same damn guy when he cold calls and he's losing money. And you see this all the time. All the effing time, you will see this. Even if you take out his small blind in big blind hands, you'll still see the guy not making as much as when he's three betting from every position. Every time I discuss this, I get guys lecturing me about balance or hands that flop well. Then I look into the database and I see this. So they can't justify it with their profit margins. And they're usually not getting the success that they want from no limit hold'em. So I'm confused. I get it in really big games. You can't just indiscriminately three bet because somebody is going to look at your 18% three bet and they're going to start four betting you. But every single time I send somebody into the field and I say, I want you to pay attention to how much they four bet you, I get a report back that said, never. It just doesn't happen. I go, great. When people are telling me, okay, you need to flat more. You absolutely must flat more. You have to flap these hands. They flop so well. They flop so well. They flop so well. I go, great. Teach me. Show me in your database how it's working. Show me in a solver why you do what you do. Help me get it. I never get an answer and that bothers me a lot because honestly, guys, this is just between you and I. I'm not in love with doing databases. The list of questions I can't answer with them is endless. I'm not comfortable with computers. I'm just trying to get better. What I really trust is combinatorics because I can do that math with pen and paper. Database analysis is weird because you don't know if you're getting a snapshot of a particular time and place and you're always seeing the data change. I'm taking lessons on using the solvers, but I would like to know more about how they work before I take everything at their word. But combinatorics are basic and they've given me a living since I graduated high school. So it would be disingenuous if I wasn't speaking about them constantly. In this spot, you know this guy is opening too much in the hijack from these sacks because who doesn't now? And most guys are just calling you out of position. So he's opening something like this. This is very optimistic as far as an opening range when it comes to North America, as far as how tight it is. And then, okay, let's say he's four betting ace king suited, ace kings and queens. Let's do this one because I've done different ones with you guys. So let's try this one today. Well, that range is not hitting a pair or a draw over half the time. And look at that range. You're going to know the exact boards he hits. It's going to be when there's two cards nine or higher. All you have to do is bet big enough to fold the gut shots, and then you will be securing a fold over half the time. Actually, if the board only has one high card, it's gonna be more than half the time. If there's no high cards, it's going to be near 60% of the time. If there's two high cards, you're not getting a fold 30% of the time. Now, I always did this math and thought, what about when they four bet? Enter the databases. I did a lot of work with card runners EV and Flopzilla over the years, but that was all theoretical. I wanted to make sure things worked in the field. That's why I started trying to use databases even though I hate computers. But I wanted further verification. That's why I called on Mike. If I've learned anything in life, it's that I need to find someone who is doing better than me and cheat off their paper. Mike Wasserman is the type of pro I look up to because of everything he's done over the years. And when I watched him win the Sunday Million for this new product, that guy threw that every time he could. One time, I was just talking with him and I started saying multi-weight pots are death and he practically completed the sentence for me. He was like, yeah, they're the worst thing in the world. 
Mike emphatically said yes when we were discussing that. Mike is the kind of guy who will learn from anyone and carefully test his statements, but I never heard him more sure of anything. The problem with multi-way pots is you need to hit something. Usually someone has something so there's no bluffing. Waiting to hit hands is called gambling. Making people fold when you have nothing is called professional gambling. You don't need cards to win them. That's why our second item on how to win big tournaments, number one is don't piss away C-bets. That adds up to 10, 20, 30 big blinds by the end of the tournament. And number two, get them heads up. All right, and that wraps up part one of this series. What I learned in this episode was two keys for winning big field MTTs are number one, don't mindlessly see bet because every chip counts. And number two, get your opponent heads up because it's a lot easier to win the pot when you're playing just against one opponent and one range of hands than multiple opponents and multiple ranges of hands. Now, those were my key takeaways, but I would love to know your key takeaways as well. I always learn from them, so please post them in the comment section of this video um, along with any questions you have about the material in this video. I and Mike as well will be in there doing our best to answer every single question that's posted so we can all learn from each other. Be sure to read the other comments that are down there as well if you have time because there's lots of golden nuggets hidden in there to learn from. Speaking of Mike, the special announcement that I mentioned at the start of the video is that Mike is joining Team Gripst. He is going to be another one of our tournament teachers. And Mike, I mean, I'm really happy about this because in 2013, when I started studying tournaments with um, Griffin Benger and Calvin Anderson, Mike was also one of the guys that I started studying with. And he was very kind of quiet, very humble, very reserved. But I learned very quickly that this guy knew the game very well and that his work ethic was unmatched. So when I wanted to make that transition, transition from being a full-time cash game player to being a full-time tournament player, Mike was one of the people that helped me with transition and also really understood where I was coming from and was able to help me move through that process really easily. So Mike's someone who understands the game really well, he can teach it really well, and he's just someone who's been through it firsthand himself. So I'm, I'm really excited to have him joining the team, and I hope you are too. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, part two of this series is gonna be released tomorrow where we are going to teach you the three more keys for winning big field MTTs. And at the end of that video as well, we are gonna have a special promotional offer for Alex and Mike's new program, Mike's first program for grips.com, how to win the Sunday million. It is an epic hand history review with a whole lot of Flopzilla use, ICMizer use, and more. More on that in tomorrow's video. And and I look forward to seeing you then. Till then, you know what to do. Take what you learned, go out there, and get stacking.